to bring you up to speed as to where we were uh, on Sunday, we were looking at the, well, beginning at the first point where we were discussing death is the separation, spiritual death is separation from God, and union with God is uh, eternal life. And in order to have that union, we need cleansing of our sins. And so what we're looking now at is the pattern that the Old Testament provided to us regarding their purification um, rites. And what we pointed out, that there is always in association with the blood by which we are cleansed because of the life that's in the blood, Leviticus uh, chapter 17, we also see that the water always accompanies the blood. And so we saw that in the Passover event where the scriptures tell us that the Israelites were baptized into Moses as they went through the Red Sea. We saw it in the, uh, uh, and of course you had the, bloody, the atoning blood of the Passover lamb that uh, freed them from uh, uh, Pharaoh. And then we looked at the inauguration of the law of Moses, which ultimately meant that the people were sprinkled with blood and water. And now we're looking at the consecration of the priest under the old law. And what we have seen is the four, the four elements that was necessary, sacrificial death, the blood, the water, and the anointing of the holy oil. With that having been said, we pointed out that the prophecy of Joel said that God would pour out his uh, Holy Spirit, of which the anointing oil of the, of the high priest and the priest was um, a prophetic figure. And so we ended up last Sunday that Jesus is the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And the Messiah being from the Hebrew, Christ being from the Greek, both meaning the anointed one the anointed one of God, the one who has received the Holy Spirit in the same way or the, or the uh, prophetic way that the priest under the old law received the anointing holy oil, which was a prophecy of the coming uh, Holy Spirit. And then I want to insert here, and we'll get to this a uh, little bit later in the class, but it's important to know that not only is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the anointed one of God, the one who received the Holy Spirit of God, but we likewise have, being the other sons of God, have received that anointing. 1 John 2, 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, the Holy One being God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, now he who establishes us with you in Christ, there's that word in Christ, we have our sins washed away, therefore we're able to have union with Christ. And so we always say, look for the in Christ verses, right? Because that shows those who are in Christ are the ones chosen for salvation. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, the Holy One referred to in 1 John 2, 20, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So I'll pose these questions and then we will uh, get to these a little bit later, but I just want to plant these questions in your mind. When did Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest, receive God's anointing Holy Spirit? He is the anointed one, and he did receive the Holy Spirit according to the prophecy of Joel, uh, Joel 2.28. question is, when did Jesus receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit? And since we are the holy ones who receive the anointing as well, the question posed then is, as God's royal priesthood, when did we receive God's anointing of the Holy Spirit? And the hint is when we received the blood and the water, which is the pattern that the old law of Moses has set for us in terms of purification of God's saints. So with that bringing us up to speed, let's look at the Day of Atonement. Now the Day of Atonement, well, let me back up and just say that when we look at the the kingdom of Israel, this was a prophetic figure of the kingdom of Christ. Man and God have been separated by sin, and we were in the fallen world, and God is working to reestablish his relationship with his beloved children. In doing that, he established the kingdom of Israel where he dwells again with his people, and his dwelling with the people was in the temple, in the tabernacle. 
So we have God dwelling with his people, but in order for him to do that, he has to purify them because we suffer from sin, do we not? So he had a purification process in place to purify those under the first covenant, the law of Moses. He made provision for sins that they could remain in a covenant relationship with him. And that covenant relationship was established by a purification that involved, once again, blood and water. So by way of explanation, you had the tabernacle, and I think all of you hopefully are aware of this, but not we're going to go through it anyway. The tabernacle consisted of two chambers or sanctuaries, and the inner chamber was the most holy place or the holy of holies, and this is where God's presence dwelt. This is where the, the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat was, and God dwelt in the inner chamber uh, called the holy of holies or the most holy place, and it's a prophetic figure of heaven. Then the outer chamber is called the holy place, and the only entrance into the inner sanctuary is through the outer chamber, and the outer chamber is a prophetic figure of the church. The only way you get into heaven is through the kingdom of Christ, the church, to enter into heaven, and we have that representation here in the uh, temple. So, to purify his people, for God to dwell in their presence by way of the tabernacle, on the seventh day of the tenth month, God established the Day of Atonement. So let's uh, look real quickly here. And first of all, just point out, here's our outer chamber, the holy place. Here is our inner chamber, the holy of holies, where God dwelt. This outer court symbolized the world. Okay, Here is the bread of the presence, uh, the show bread, which... Um, corresponds to our communion. Here is the incense altar corresponding to our prayers as spoken in Revelations. And here was the light. And the light could represent the light of God's word, the, the candle lights of the, uh, the lamp lights of the churches, and the light of God. So this represents the church here, and this is where God dwelt. And the only way to get in to the holy place was through the outer chamber, the representation of the church. So when the high priest came, he needed to make atonement for sins of the people, to make purification. And the first thing he did was wash himself, fully cleanse himself, which is the representation of baptism. Then they, they offered sacrifices, and he took the blood into the holy place, the most holy place, and he sprinkled it in the horns of the altar and purified the temple the tabernacle, which again involved cleansing and blood, cleansing of water and cleansing of blood. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, you know, one thing I've never heard that equated to like the world, the church, heaven, I've never heard that. Yeah, we'll get to it. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's further down the road, but yeah, certainly. But Hebrews specifically points out that the inner chamber is heaven, a copy of heaven. Um, there's no verse of scripture that says that the outer chamber is the uh, representation of the church. However, you have the priests entering into the outer chamber and the high priest going through the outer chamber into the inner chamber. And there you have like the communion bread, you have the incense, you have the light of the candle. And by the way, this is the curtain that separated the two, and Hebrews tells us that curtain is the body of Christ. So you can see it all coming together. And in the outer world is where you see the sacrifices are offered, and you see where baptism takes place, which corresponds to the world here. Where does God sanctify us in baptism? Well, it's here in this world. And then when we're baptized, we enter into the most holy place as priests. But we'll look at that more uh, coming up, okay? Okay, finally, to conclude our study over the blood and the water, in 1 John 5, 6, uh, the Apostle John said, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water alone, but with water and the blood. And so we read in John uh, nineteen thirty four. 
when Jesus had been declared dead or thinking he was dead, they didn't break his bones, but the Roman soldier pierced his side into his heart with a spear. And what out poured out was blood and water, which as John said, Jesus came by blood and water. Okay. Jesus is our high priest, and the high priest under the old law were consecrated, which we've been through. It's been through the sacrifices, the blood, the water, and the Holy Spirit, the representation by the anointing of the holy oil. So now we're going to look at the consecration of Jesus Christ as our high priest. Now, under the old law, the ceremonial washings were a prophetic figures of uh, the new covenants required baptisms under the new covenant the washing way of sins. The old law baptisms or washings by water were not a universal requirement for entrance into the law of Moses. You were born into the law of Moses. And there were ceremonial washes of hands and ceremonial washing of dishes. And in the later phases, late ages of the kingdom, People, as I read, were engaging in ceremonial baptisms or cleansing of themselves leading up to the baptism of John. And there was also, uh, the literature says that if a person wanted to convert to Judaism, they would do a cleansing of them. But I don't see that anywhere in the written law of uh, Moses. But we do know that the washing of water was an absolute purification requirement for the priesthood. Now, in the New Covenant, there are two water baptisms. There's baptism into Christ for the remission of sins, and clearly that's not applicable to Christ. Number one, when we're baptized in Christ, we're baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection, and Jesus just now beginning his, his ministry uh, long before, or three years before he entered into his uh, sacrifice. So... And, of course, he's sinless. So baptism in Christ for remission of sins is not applicable to Christ. And then there's John's baptism, which is a, re, a baptism for repentance. It was preparatory, and it's likewise not applicable to Christ. So the question becomes, we have to ask ourselves, why then was Jesus baptized? So let's answer that question. And I'll start out with questions and answers here. Why were the priests under the old law consecrated by blood and water? And the answer to that question is that we've just been through Exodus 29. God commanded it. Did he not? God speaking to Moses at Exodus 29.1. Now this is what you shall do to them to concentrate, consecrate them to be ministers to me. To minister as priests to me. And that included the sacrifices, that included the blood, that included the washings and so forth, and the anointing of oil. Question number two, why did John baptize? And the answer to that question is God likewise commanded it. Let's look at, and we've been through this verse, but we have to come back to it several times. John 1.33, he, this is the testimony of John. He, that is God, who sent me, that is John, to baptize in water. So we, now we know that God commanded John to baptize, and that baptism is in water. Said to me, he upon you, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So what we know now is God commanded John to baptize with water, and he's baptizing everybody who's willing to be baptized. But in specifically, God is telling John, the one who is baptized by you and the Spirit remains on him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. This is the Christ, the anointed one. So in Luke 20, verse 4, we see this question that Jesus poses to the Pharisees. The Pharisees approached him with a question asking, by what authority do you do all these miraculous things? And Jesus said, I will answer your question if you'll answer mine. And that question was that Jesus posed to him, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And clearly Jesus knew it was from heaven. And so the Pharisees um, refused to attempt to answer the question. And so uh, they didn't get their other answer from uh, uh, 
Jesus, although by, by this question that he poses here, he answered their question. His authority is from God, just as John's baptism was from God. So, the consecration of the priest and royal law was commanded by God. The baptism of John was commanded by God. And he re God reveals that the one who received the Holy Spirit at the baptism of John is the Holy One. So question, when John tried to prevent Jesus from being baptized, what did Jesus say? He says, to fulfill all righteousness, John 3, 15. But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Remember we studied that word righteousness? Righteousness means innocent. Innocent means sinless, but it also carries with the sense of the root word decay, which means justice. It's right standing with the law. In short, righteousness is obedience to God, which is a behavior that is sinless. We're going to obey God. We're going to fulfill all righteousness. Therefore, you're going to baptize me because God commanded it. So why did God command his son Jesus to be baptized? Answer, God appointed Jesus high priest and therefore required his consecration. Jesus was sinless, so he didn't need to repent. Jesus was not going to be baptized in his own baptism for forgiveness of sins, but Jesus was the high priest. Remember, we're still living under the old law at this time. The high priest was consecrated, and therefore, and when the high priest is consecrated, he receives the anointing of the holy oil, which is representation of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. God is going to consecrate Jesus Christ at baptism. And there is the water, and there's the Holy Spirit. So John 1, 33, 34, once again, we talked about he, God, sent me to baptize in water and was informed that the Spirit would descend upon the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit when he was baptized by John. So now we read in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, and we can pick up on it in other sections of the gospel. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John, to be baptized by him. Why are you being baptized? Fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? Because God commanded it. Why did God command it? Because he needs to consecrate the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ, to satisfy the requirements of the law. After being baptized, Jesus came immediately from the what came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open. He saw the Spirit of God descending upon him as a dove and lighting on him. In other words, that which God had told John has now been fulfilled in the baptism of Jesus. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So let's do three questions. Who is the Son of God? The one to whom God gave his Holy Spirit. When did God anoint his Son with the Holy Spirit? When John baptized him. Who commanded John to baptize with water? God the Father. This is the consecration of Jesus to become our high priest. Yes, sir. Okay, I don't think, maybe you weren't here for this class. Consecration means to, well, it's a derivation of the word sanctify, which means to cleanse, purify, and it also carries with it to set apart for a holy purpose. So it's, it's, being, it's consecrating the priest to make them holy and to, to set them apart perform the holy duties as a priest. Does that make sense? So, this is all pursuant. We talked about Joel, this obscure minor prophet, minor by virtue of the fact it's only three pair, uh, chapters long. But in it, the prophet Joel says that, quoting from Acts 2, six, uh, quoting from Peter in Acts chapter 2, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy was, and it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. Luke 4, Luke 4, verse 18, Jesus was reading from Isaiah 61, 1. He's quoting. They gave him the scriptures, he opens it up, and he reads Isaiah 61, 1, which is in reference to and related to Joel's prophecy. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel. 
And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So we got the prophecy of Joel 2.28. In the last days I'll pour out my spirit. The prophet Isaiah speaks of the Lord, of the Messiah himself, declaring that God has given him the anointing to preach the gospel. And Jesus declares that he has received it, uh, that anointing. And then Acts 10.38 is the apostle Peter stating, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. So we know that at John's baptism, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. According to the prophecy of Joel, according to the prophecy of Isaiah, and that Holy Spirit came upon him, upon him at the water baptism, the water cleansing, if you will, which is consistent with the consecration of the high priest under the old law. Now, Jesus, when he was baptized, certainly was not accompanied by his sacrifice, nor was it accomplished by... Uh, this is an old slide. I changed this up, but, um, well, well, we'll get through it. <laughs> but anyway, the point here, being here is that Jesus' sacrifice was yet to come. Jesus' shed blood was yet to come. That occurs with the sacrifice of Christ. But the water baptism is there. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is there when he's baptized. So now we see between the actual sacrifice of Christ and his water baptism and his anointing, the four essential elements to the high priest being consecrated. Sacrificial death, blood, water cleansing, whether it's water baptism, and anointing of the Holy Spirit. Not this time, not by oil, which is a prophetic figure of the Holy Spirit, but by the actual Holy Spirit. So, God testifies under the new covenant that we are a royal priesthood. We are God's holy servants. We are priests who minister to God in his dwelling place. And that dwelling place is God's tabernacle. Where's God's tabernacle under the new covenant? Well, it's our bodies and it's the church. And so we cite 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. So now we need to look forward to how are we consecrated? And we'll get to that. So it follows, would it not, that God's other priests who ministered to God in his tabernacle or temple must likewise be consecrated as Aaron's sons were consecrated. Remember, Aaron was the first high priest and his sons were the other priests that ministered in the tabernacle. And those consecration uh, rites, sacrificial blood, sacrificial death, the blood, the water, and the spirit all have to be present. So let's go back to 1 John 5, verses 6 and 7. This is the one who came by water and blood. Who came by water and blood? Jesus Christ, not with the water only. Look at the emphasis he's giving here. Not with water only, but with the water and the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is true. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. And then I cite again, John 19, 34 and 35. Well, uh, uh, well what do I got here? Well, what I, I, I'm paraphrasing. When the soldiers pierced his side with the spirit, immediately, immediately out came water and blood. And so the apostle John says that, and he, that's the apostle John, who has been, who has seen, has testified, and this testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. By the way, if I'm struggling a little bit, I couldn't find my glasses, so I'm... Let's see how I get home. Okay. The spirit, the water, and the blood testify to something, right? What does it testify to? John, 1 John 5, 6, it is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is truth. What is that testimony? 1 John 5, 11. And the Spirit's testimony, I, you have to go to an earlier verse to know that it's the Spirit's testimony, but uh, it is. And the Spirit's testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Who testifies to that? The Spirit, the water, and the blood. When we enter into the water and receive the blood, that's testimony that we have received 
eternal life. Why? Because the Spirit tells us so. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Who testifies? The water and the blood and the Spirit. Okay, so now we're going to segue over to baptism. And I will tell you something that I don't understand. Why all of the denomination, Christian denomination world does not embrace baptism, but they do not. So I looked up on the internet and the approximate population of the world right now is 8 billion people, of which supposedly, uh, I don't know how accurate this number is, but it makes the point regardless, that there's 2.6 billion professing Christians. That's 33%. So two thirds of the world does not believe in Christ and does not believe in baptism. Now, there's some denominational groups that call themselves Christians that don't even practice baptism. And of the other group, the vast majority don't believe that baptism is essential for salvation. I'm going to talk about this a little bit. And I'm not going to get into a defense of baptism, but I just want to point out why it's so important to know. They'll explain that baptism of scripture is symbolic, it's figurative, that the word baptism is metonymy. Metonymy is substituting one word for another. How can you say this? Say, they'll, you'll call a businessman, he's just a suit. That's metonymy. They're identifying this guy who's engaged in some form of business as a suit, if you will. If we assume 90% of all Christians do not believe in the efficacy of baptism, and I think that percentage may be higher. I don't know. I don't really know of any groups that do believe in uh, baptism for salvation. But let's use 90%. That means only 3% of everybody in the entire world for all time believes in the requirement of baptism for salvation. Most, but not all, denominations still practice baptism, but they do it in different ways. There's aspersion, which is sprinkling. There's the fusion, which is pouring. And then, of course, there is immersion, uh, which is submersion into water. So, I'll give you one example, uh, just to tell you the complexities. I think of uh, of the argument against baptism. I regard Acts 22, 16 as I call a silver bullet verse. Seven simple words. Be baptized and wash away your sins. How can you mess that up? How can you change that? Ananias speaking to the Apostle Paul after the Lord Jesus appeared to Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul asked, what shall you have me do? Well, first of all, Apostle Paul asked, who are you, Lord? And Jesus identifies himself. And he says, what will you have me do, Lord? And he says, go to Damascus, the street called Straight, and Ananias will tell you what you must do. And, and uh, I need to go back and look to make sure I got my conclusions completely um, correct. But I don't recall any instructions that Ananias gave to Apostle Paul other than to be baptized. He discloses to Paul that God had chosen him to bring the word of the gospel to the uh, Gentiles. He discloses to him, uh, um, get up and be baptized. But this is the only commandment that I know that Ananias gave him. He says, now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. That is real clear to me. How do you change that? So, by the way, if you look at a commentary on Acts 2.38, you will end up with two pages of commentary explaining why the literal words, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, doesn't mean repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Most of the time when you come to Acts 22.16, those commentaries will refer you back to the commentary to Acts 2.38. But here's one little simple explanation. Concerning the words, be baptized and wash away your sins, because Paul was already cleansed spiritually at the time Christ appeared to him, these words must refer to the symbolism of baptism. I do not see where Paul was cleansed spiritually when he saw the risen Christ. Paul asked, 
What must I do? What do you want me to do? He says, go to Ananias and he'll tell you what to do. Somehow or other, they've concluded that because Paul actually saw the risen Christ, therefore he believed, therefore he's saved. Remember what I talked about, the hermeneutic principles? God's word is truth. When one verse appears to intersect and contradict another verse, you don't cancel one out and discard it, nor do you rationalize it away, calling it figurative or symbolic. You have to reconcile the two. But what the vast majority of the Christian denominational world has done is that they rationalized away all of the baptism verses, saying none of them mean what they literally say. Just one example, when Paul said, what will you have me do, Lord? One commentary said, well, that's proof he's saved. Because by faith, he's asking Jesus what to do. Paul is doing nothing more than what the Jews did on the day of Pentecost. When they were told that they had crucified the Messiah, they, Messiah, they were pierced in, hearts, in their heart and said, what must I do? They were given one commandment. Repent, well, two, I guess. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Paul likewise said, I've been persecuting the church to the death, and now Jesus is here. He was pierced to the heart. What would you have me do, Lord? Go to Ananias, and Ananias tells him to be baptized to wash away his sins. Any questions or thoughts on that? I, I, I have to be honest with you. I'll... I'll have to cross over the Jordan, talk to God face to face why people rationalize the little words of Scripture. I don't get it. And that's why I'm trying to build a case so strong here. So why is it so important? If God's words is understood by scriptural, it's, it's God's words, God's meshes is understood by the little words of Scripture, then baptism, of course, combined with faith, repentance, and confession, is essential for washing away of our sins. It's essential for purification and holiness and sinlessness. And that purification is essential with, for having union with Christ because remember our sins separate us from God. Therefore, if our sins are not washed away, we can't have union with Christ. And union with Christ is essential for having eternal life. And having eternal life and union with Christ is essential to becoming God's children. And having our sins washed away and having union with Christ and having eternal life and being God's children is essential for entrance into the church, which is God's kingdom. And guess what's essential to enter, to enter into heaven? Being in God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. It's a verse we skip over a lot of times. I think I might have mentioned it in one of the earlier classes, but here it is again. Talking about... Paul has talked about how we're going to be transformed at the end of the age into, from the earthly into the heavenly, from the weak into the powerful, and so forth. And he, and he says, that, I tell you a mystery, in a wink of an eye we shall all be changed. And he drops down to 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and he says, Then comes the end, referring to the end of the age, when he, being Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God and Father. We enter into Christ, we enter into his body, the church, we enter into his kingdom, and then at the end of the age, what does God do? He hands the kingdom over to the Father. And where is the Father? The Father is in heaven. And we're going to talk about the kingdom a whole lot more later on, but when we become, when we enter into the kingdom, guess what happens? We become citizens of heaven. Okay. Now let's deal with pouring and sprinkling and immersion. The word for baptism is a transliterated Greek word. And there's all kinds of, well, there's one principal theory as to why it was transliterated. Transliterated meaning the translators simply took the Greek word and adopted it and stuck it into the English. And so they made a Greek word an English word. But it means to dip. The, the root word means to dip. Baptize, baptizo, in the verb form, means to immerse, to dip, to sink, or wash. Baptism, baptisma, is the noun form, meaning immersion, dipping, or sinking, or cleansing. Pretty clear. The, I'll go ahead and put it out there because I find it so interesting, but the thought was when the King James translators came to baptism, they were stuck between a rock and a hard place because... 
they are of the Church of England. The king is over the Church of England, and the Church of England did not believe in immersion. But they didn't want to lie, so they just simply took the Greek word and placed it into Scripture, which allowed anybody to interpret it the way they wanted to, and the world does. Okay, now let's talk about water. And I know you've heard this, but I'll say it again. Every example of actual baptism, it's always in water. Uh, this is the testimony of John at Matthew 3.11. As for me, John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance. Matthew 3.16, talking about Jesus' baptism. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. You don't need to walk down into the water if you're being sprinkled. You need, don't need to walk down into the water if you're being poured on. But Jesus went down into the water. Then let's do Acts 8.36, which is, a, which is a beautiful set of passages. Philip, who was a deacon in the church, had hands laid upon him, and he was out uh, evangelizing, if you will. And he had this Ethiopian eunuch. Who's studying Isaiah 53? We're all familiar with Isaiah 53. We hear it quite a bit when we do the Lord's Supper talk. And he doesn't understand it. And so Philip explains it to him. And he explains to him the word of God. And so they're traveling along. And then we get to verse 36. Philip, an Ethiopian eunuch, studying, which was studying Isaiah 53, went along the road and they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered, he being Philip, ordered the chair to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized them, and they came up out of the water. Now, not only did the eunuch go into the water, but Philip went in the water. They both went down in the water, and they both came up out of the water. The question is, why? Because there's two commandments on baptism, not just one, two. The first is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are given the commandment to baptize others, as we are given the commandment to be baptized. Acts 22, verse 16, and Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, you see Philip obeying the commandment of God at Matthew 28, 19, to baptize. And you see the Ethiopian eunuch obeying the commandment at Acts 22, 16, to be baptized. So they both had to go down into the water. Therefore, since it's immersion, they both had to come up out of the water. Questions or thoughts on that at all? Yes, sir. Um, don't have to, but like we have a baptist, well, you just about have to. I guess if you want to stand on the outside of the baptistry and lean over and push them in. Um, but if you're at the Jordan River, well, even at their own baptistry, the baptizer goes into the water. But that's not a necessity. The one that needs to go in the water is the one who is being baptized. That makes sense? Okay, now we have Cornelius and his household. Uh, this is where God reveals that the Gentiles have received uh, the new covenant and can be saved. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. And so this is the Peter talking, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, referring to the church, which of course is the body of the saved, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. There's that word sanctify, to purify, to cleanse. Having cleansed her, how? By the washing of water. Which ties in very nicely to Acts 22, 16, does it not? What's there to, what's, how can that be confusing? We've already learned baptism is the medium for immersion into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So now the question becomes, how do we receive the blood and the water? The blood. So the 
we're going to go into this. The prophetic pattern under the law of Moses that we had been discussing shows that water is the medium by which we receive the blood of Christ. And as we'll find out also as we go further along, it's also the medium by which we're immersed into Christ and immersed into his body, which is the church. So, the consecration of the children of God as the royal priest of the new covenant requires our baptism immersion into water, just like Jesus was immersed into water, and just like the consecration under the old law of the priest required the water and the blood. Now, here's the important point to point out. Uh, I would love to have a silver bullet verse on this, but I have, in full disclosure, there is not a single verse that tells you that you receive the blood of Christ at the time you are baptized. We know it's the blood that cleanses us of our sins. Then why does God tell us that our sins are cleansed when we receive the water? Okay, let's go back to our hermeneutical principles. You have to reconcile the verses because truth does not contradict truth. So let's look here. Well, the point I wanted to make here on my slide is, for every verse that states we are cleansed, forgiven, and saved at baptism, there is a corresponding set of verses that tell us that we are cleansed, forgiven, and saved by the blood of Christ. What does that mean? Be baptized and wash away your sins. The blood of Christ washes away your sins. Which one is the lie? Which one is false? They're both from God. God has declared them both truth. Sounds like to me they don't contradict. So let's take a look here. Forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Peter said to them, repent. Remember when the uh, old law was inaugurated, the people vowed obedience? Well, those who enter into the new law, the law of Christ, the new covenant, likewise must vow obedience. That's called repentance. And each one of you be baptized, immersed in water we establish, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Okay, Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the forgiveness of our sins. Hebrews 9, 22. We've talked about this passage. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So now I ask you, which one's the lie? Which one did God lie to us about? Acts 2.38, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, or Matthew 26.28, this is the blood of my covenant poured out for forgiveness of sins. I can't hear. God cannot lie. They're both truth. So we have to draw the conclusion that we access the cleansing blood through the water. And how can we confirm that because we can look at 1500 years of purification rites under the old law where the priests were consecrated with blood and water. Okay, let's look at washing or cleansing. Remember sanctification is purification which is cleansing. And here's my favorite verse, the seven words, be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Ephesians 5, 25 through 26, as God also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, cleanse her, having cleansed her by the what? The washing water. Baptism washes away our sins, does it not? That's what he says here. Well, then let's look at Revelation 1, 5. Jesus Christ to him who loved and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Wait a minute. You just told me my sins are washed away in baptism waters. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of his son, Jesus, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Which is it? The baptismal waters or is it the blood? Romans 5, 9, having now been justified. Remember what that word justified means? To be declared righteous. What does righteousness mean? To be innocent. What does innocence mean? To be sinless. Having now been justified, made clean by his blood, we shall be saved. We're washed by his blood. Hebrews 13, 12, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, which is the truth and which is the lie. 
And the answer is they're both true. Therefore, it tells us according to 1,500 years of practice under the old law, we receive the blood of Christ when we enter into the water. Okay, let's try one more. Salvation from sin's death. Mark 16, 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism now saves you. Then drop down to Romans 5, 9. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved. So all the passages on baptism says we are cleansed, we are forgiven, and we are saved at baptism. And then we have a lot of other passages that tell us that we are saved by the blood, cleansed by the blood, and um, uh, forgiven of our sins by the blood. Does it not make sense that we receive the blood at the point of baptism, that our sins are washed away? Am I out of time? Okay, we'll end it right there.